Thank you for uh, joining us today. We are gonna have a great workshop today with um, Louis Strong and Ingram Monser from Proven Recruiting. And I'm gonna hand it off to Louis and Ingram to introduce themselves and to talk about Proven and their, their startup journey. And um, just to let you know, thank you for joining us. If you guys have questions for us, we're going to put have you um, put them in the chat and um, you know the the Rack Innovation Lab is an educational uh, startup incubator and we're just grateful to be able to put on these workshops for you guys so with without you know wasting any more time I just want to hand it off to Lewis thank you very much thank you Angela thank you Stephen and the rest of Rec for having me back and and bringing on my partner here Ingram Lostner so uh, I'll let Ingram start Okay, what do you want me to say? Just introduce myself <laughs> through the slides. Um, first of all, right, I, I think this is the second um, rec workshop that I've been a part of, um, and I just love these things. Um, I get fired up and inspired, um, you know, just with the, the videos, right, that I see. Um, you know, that's, um, you know, I often joke to, to the members of, of, of our team, right, that if I had a hashtag, right, my hashtag would be inspired by youth. Um, because I just love the passion um, and the commitment and the drive that we see out of all of the students uh, and all of the participants in this workshop. So first off, I know I don't know if Tanya's here, but Angela, Stephen, thank you to you guys for continuing to put on these great programs with, with, with these great people. And hopefully Lewis and I can continue to provide you know, a small amount of value um to, to how everybody um um you know is going to think about um, their ideas going forward so you know just we, very briefly we couldn't do it without our mentors our mentors absolutely are invaluable what you provide to us and and our workshops and to our students is just incredible we couldn't do it without you guys so thank you so much well thank you for saying that and, and i think that that will speak to you know certainly one of the the 10 lessons that we talk about and that's um, you know, related to social, uh, social entrepreneurship, giving back, being a part of the community, which, I, which again, I mean, you just see and feel that um, in every person's comments that, that, that was on the video. And that's so, so important. And that's why I think that we at Proven Recruiting, right, and I know Mike is on the call, I think Shen is on the call, you know, those who are involved in um, creating some of your programs um, and being mentors, um, you know, that's why we're, we're so happy and proud to be a part of this phenomenal uh, organization and phenomenal people. So that said, me, um, you know, I am Ingram. Um, I'm Lewis's partner. Um, you know, we, uh, my background as people can probably hear is, is not from the United States. I always joke that I'm from, you know, the Eastern part of Texas. Can't you tell from my accent? Um, as as the, the, the discerning amongst you will, will have realized I'm from, from over the pond. I'm originally from uh, the United Kingdom. I uh, came out here in 95, 96, met Lewis in 96 at our previous company. Um, and 11 years later, um, we decided to start Proven. Um, uh, so I, I'll leave it there, Lewis, because I, I know that a lot of, you know, my background, your background is going to be, um, you know, wrapped into the, the Proven story and some of the 10 lessons. So, but that's basically who I am. Um, you know, I'm passionate about life, passionate about business, passionate about mm. people. With that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Lewis. Okay. Um, I'll just start by saying that um, I am an immigrant as well. I came to the United States when I was uh, five, six years old. I uh, grew up mostly in Washington, D.C., and then came to San Diego in 1996 uh, when I started at K-Force, which is where I met Ingram, um, and started on my journey of recruiting and getting into the recruiting business. And so with that, I'm actually going to just start um, so I just want to make sure that we're we're set here. I've got one slide for every single lesson. So we're, we're going to go through 100. I'm just kidding. It's a, it's a joke. Okay. You scared us. You scared us. So it, it's 10 lessons. It's an, it's, a, it's an intentional typo. But um, so we'll start with the first lesson. Okay. Um, many of you will be disappointed that beyond, hold on one second beyond the title we will have no words beyond the title so we're just going to we're going to talk to the images that that we've selected for this slide today for each of the slides today so ingram why don't you start 
Well, the first thing I would say, is, who are these people, right? Who, who are the two guys that are in there? I, I don't recognize them. Um, I think that that might be younger versions of ourselves, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, th there is a funny story, and my wife won't mind me um, telling this story. It, it is very, first of all, it's very, very important to choose the right partner in whatever you do. Um, but I will tell a little story about, um, uh, about my picture. So um, as you can probably see, that's the day that I actually got married. Um, 38, nearly 38 years ago, 39 years ago. Um, you know, yes, I got married when I was about 10. Um, no, that, that's my wife. She's still my wife. Um, you know, I've been blessed to have a partner in life that's been able to support me through, um, you know, many of the challenges, the professional challenges um, that uh, exist when you're starting your own business. That's very, very important. We'll come on to that in a second. Just very quickly, brief story um, on that picture. So when my younger son was um, uh, about, I don't know, six or seven, right? We had this picture on the wall and I pointed to me and he said, who's that? And I said to him, who's that? And he went, that's Dada, right? Yep, absolutely. Who's that? I don't know, right? Which didn't exactly please my wife at the time uh, that he didn't actually recognize her. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it's a good story. True. Point being, um, choose the right partner in life. Choose the right partner in business. I certainly um, don't believe that I could have done this without uh, without Lewis. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about the compatibility, the strengths and weaknesses. But regardless, um, you know, most of you will have experienced some of the the joys and the trials and the tribulations of of trying to start your own gig. Um, a problem, what is the, the, the quote? A problem shared is a problem halved or, or something like that. So I think that there's an emotional component to having somebody with you by your side, sharing in the joys, commiserating in, 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 with some of the disappointments, and most importantly, um, being almost like a third or fourth shoulder, not to cry on, but to, to commiserate with and, and, and to, to bounce ideas off and, and to, to share challenges and so on. Really, really important. Um, and as, as many of you can see, Lewis and I are different people, obviously. Um, we have um, you know, different personality styles, right? You'll see that over the course of the, uh, of the next hour or so. Um, and we have different strengths and weaknesses and we focus upon different areas of the business, but we complement each other really, really well, not just in those strengths and weaknesses, but most importantly, right? It's the value system where we are rock solid. Obviously there has to be trust, right? But in terms of our core values, which feed into the kind of company that we've tried to build, right? That's been absolutely critical. So, you know, choosing the right partner in life, choosing the right partner in business, is important because you know there are going to be some tough times and some challenges and if you have somebody that's with you that understands um, you know, everything that you're going through at a personal level in addition to complementing your strengths um, invaluable I don't believe that we would be where we're at right now um, if I was doing it on my own yeah just to just to follow up on that, um, I can't remember who told me this when I was younger, but somebody says to me, said to me once that the most important decision that I could make in my life was the partner that I chose. And, and they were referencing uh, my, my personal life, my marriage. And, you know, I, I think like Ingram, um, I've known Leanne since 1989. So that's what, 32 years? Um, we've been married since 97 so that's 24 years um and that's you know one of the things that i think that is very similar about ingram and myself is that we both met our significant others in our teens basically 19 and uh, maybe maybe right at, right outside of my teens in my 20 when i was 20 but really early on in life um but then also with ingram we both um come from a value-based system even though I was raised as a Christian and even though Ingram was raised Jewish, um, we both have values that we can connect to that align us together. And I think it's one of the most important things. Um, there have been times when, you know, Ingram and I have disagreed, but 
as a whole, you know, I, I completely, absolutely, 100% agree with Ingram that this company would not be where it is today um, without Ingram. And not, you know, could I have started a company by myself? Absolutely. Could have Ingram have started a company by himself? Absolutely. But I think in many ways, it's like having a family. Are there plenty of families that that are single parent families? Absolutely. And are they successful? Absolutely. But they're they're really hard, extremely difficult to do. And it's something that I think when you can find the right partner or partners, um, it's extremely, it's so much better. Um, and one of the things that I do have is the journey is so much better together. And I think, you know, it's, it's something that for that we've been very fortunate with, um, you know, for, for us, we worked together for 11 years before um, we started Proven Together. But, um, you know, it wasn't intentional that we worked together. But when we did get together, having started three months apart at K-Force, we got the opportunity to work together, to be around each other, to see how the other worked, to see how the other behaved. And the, over the course of time, we grew to trust each other. And then ultimately be able to to trust each other enough to be able to start the business. So, um, you know, while we don't have each other in this picture together, um, well, actually, you'll see one together in a second. But, um, you know, both in our personal lives and our professional lives, business lives, I think we've been extremely uh, fortunate and to have the people that we've had in our lives, both in our personal lives with our wives and then also with each other as business partners. So, um, and also just as a reminder, um, this, we would rather have a dialogue. So anytime you guys have questions, um, please feel free to interrupt. Um, rather rather have a conversation than just a monologue from, from the two of us, okay? Well, can, I, can I add something in here? Uh, Absolutely. I just have to say, I love that analogy that single parent startups are hard. I, I've never thought of it that way, but what, what, what a great way to, to put it. And, and um, I don't have a question, but I just wanna say wholeheartedly agreed. Look, there are times when you, you feel Absolutely. like I wish I could make this decision by myself. Ah, let's just get, yeah. let me just get it done and make the decision. But at times, like so many times, I've said, "Thank God he's around," because at least I can mentally and and physically take a break away from the business, you know. And even like with kids, you know, there are times when we just need to get out of the house. Just like, oh my God, I need to get out. I need to get away. Okay. And when when you're not when you don't have a partner, it's so much harder to do. Yeah. Go ahead, Ingram. Um, no, there's a, there's a question from um, uh, Eric Leon Estrada. Uh, what are your thoughts on sole, part, sole proprietorships versus partnerships? Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll take that. Um, so, you know, there, there's the two aspects. There's the legal aspect. Um, and then there's, you know, the aspect that, that Lewis and I have talked about, um, you know, which is really more the professional and emotional support uh, that, that you have. But, you know, obviously you have to look at the what what's the best legal structure um, that will allow you to function operationally and efficiently um, and in the most financially efficient, tax efficient way. Um, and that's really something that's dependent upon the type of business um, and, um, you know, both work. Um, you know, we, you have, there, there are many different legal structures um, that, um, you know, companies can uh, adopt um, and it really depends, um, Eric, on the type of business that you that you have, the number of people that are involved, what the aims and objectives are. Both work, um, but there are very significant, um, you know, legal requirements, tax requirements that are um, unique to both, um, as there are with you know corporations. Um, and that's something that you know, as far as guidance is concerned, it depends. And that's something that you would. Um, you know, obtain advice from, you know, um, whatever accountant or financial advisor is, is giving you the best advice. Thank you so just, much. Just, just to add on to that, I think one of the most important things that Ingram and I shared was a vision of what kind of company we were going to be. And so we, we, we envisioned from the very beginning that we would not be, we started with, there were five other people in addition to myself and Ingram. So there were seven of us. And there was, the vision wasn't to be a seven person company 10 years from, from when we started, we're 14 years in. The, the vision from, from the very beginning was that Ingram and I would get out of the way and we would not be personally doing the business. If we're going to open up a bakery, we would not be the bakers. We would be the, per, the people running the bakery and not being the bakers, not being the dishwashers, not being the, the cashiers, not being the waiters and the waitresses and, and whoever else is running a bakery. Okay, and so I think it's very important 
you know, if, if your business and, you know, this, we have one type of business. Okay. Um, if your if your vision is to be a sole proprietor, then that's great. Um, and, and since some of the things won't necessarily be, be applicable to you, not everything, but a lot of this will still will be. Um, but, you know, I think just, just, just to keep in mind that this is about growing a, a larger business from scratch, from zero. Um, it was originally 18 million, but this year we're on pace to do 20 million. So uh, I changed the slide as well to, to reflect that. Um, so there's Can I briefly chime in real quick? Of course. Um, I like what you guys are saying. And there's one thing that I would like to share about partnership. I see that the two of you um, have each other and then perhaps it sounds like even started with more people. But even to the person who's a sole proprietor, the way I look at it is that we're always in partnership. So whoever we're buying our resources from or doing any technology media with, it's, it's always a partnership. So I think choosing the people that we feel the best with helps move any business along. That's what I'm getting out of it. It doesn't necessarily have to be two business partners. It's just whoever you're working with resource-wise is also a partnership. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's something that, you know, honestly, that, that in the beginning, when you're first starting out, you, you almost try to do business with whoever wants, whoever is willing to give you business. Um, and sometimes you make sacrifices and compromises and they frankly bite you in the ass and you, you regret them later. Um, but, you know, especially ones that are the, the closest ones to you, the ones that you are doing the business with or doing, working with every single day, you got to be extremely careful with and to make sure that they have the values that you have. Um, and they complement you. Um, you know, my wife and I are very different. Ingram and I are very different. Um, my wife is uh, very outgoing and, and commands um, the stage when wherever we go. Um, and I'm not that that person. And, and Ingram, you know, very much in, in our company is the person that is much more in front than I am. But, you know, we complement each other in a way that's neither one of us are fighting for the stage. We're not both trying to do the same thing. And I think it's, it's extremely important as you as you pick your partners and the pick, pick the people that you uh, have in your life, that they are a compliment to you and not, a, not and you don't see them as competitors. Um, so, with you know, that, there's one other point, if I may. was it Kimia that asked the question? I think my name Kim is actually pronounced Kimia. Kimia, my apologies. So, Kimia. Um, so, thank you for that question. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that I would also say is, you know, the fact that we have become, um, you know, as Lewis has said, at the very beginning, you, you, you know, if you want to survive, um, you have to make certain sacrifices as it relates to the people that you do business with to a degree. Um, but as we've grown and as we've become more embedded in the community, right, we can choose who we want to do business with to a degree, right? And we can use our position to um, uh, establish uh, a preference of doing business with those who do share our values and to not do business with those that clearly are operating in a manner that's counterintuitive to our values. And, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion Right, as an initiative that we have uh, championed, embraced, sought to um, uh, advance. Uh, and so, you know, part of our um, approach to business is now encouraging people with whom we do business, right, um, to have real and meaningful DEI initiatives within their own company. And that's just one example. So I think your point, Kenya, um, is very well made and very well taken. It's not just about who you choose as a, you know, legal business partner. Uh, it is very much about uh, the people that you employ uh, and the, the the companies with whom you, you, you choose to do business. Thank you for uh, confirming that, because I just look at all aspects of business, um, our relationships, because there's teamwork involved, people collaborating and coming together. And so that's really important. And like you, both of you gentlemen are bringing to the table, being on the same page, or collaborating in a way where all people are feeling inspired really allows the business and the vision to come forth with much more ease. Yep, well said. Yeah. 
going to have another slide, aren't we, in a minute? I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty, but I will be, it'll be up in one second. Okay, so I don't have it exactly in, in the order that I wanted, but. Okay, can you guys, can you guys see that? We can. Yes, we can. All right. So there's a couple different layers of this, this, this picture here. Um, that right there is uh, one of our top performing recruiters of all time, Mr. Puyo Hushim, who is based out of our LA operation. In his hand, he is holding uh, what's called a brick. And um, when, when people produce over $100,000 in one month, pre we present them with a brick. And, and Puyo actually did it. I can't re even remember now when he actually did it, but I think it might, be, it might have been like four or five years ago at this time. But uh, we surprised him because he was the first person to ever um, bill over $100,000 in, in one month. And um, we now do that as a, as a regular custom for people that do it in their first month or their first time in a year. Um, we were doing it every time that people were doing it. And we started to go broke because everybody started doing, not everybody, but a number of people started doing it three, four, five, six times in a year. So um, one, it's hard to get those bricks. And two, um, it's, it's a lot of money to give out. It's $1,000 effectively um, to give out. But um, as, as I said earlier, Ingram and I, were, we spent 11 years at K-Force. Um, and during that time, I went from being the most junior recruiter in the San Diego office by at least five years uh, to ultimately being the managing director of a 72-person office when I left. And during that time, I learned how to manage. I learned how to lead. I learned how to run an operation. I learned about real estate. I learned about hiring. I learned about firing. I learned about everything, almost everything that you can imagine when it came to uh, running a business. And, you know, when, when I left, in, when we left in, in 2007, um, I was really bitter. I was extremely angry and pissed off. I thought I was going to stay with the company uh, un in, until retirement, and they had robbed me of my future. And, and ultimately, you know, if it wasn't for them treating us the way that they did in, in the last couple of years that we were there, we would have never started Proven. And, you know, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned as a result of being at K-Force was that I got the opportunity to learn how to run a business on their dime. They taught me how to do operations, to do real estate, to work with people, to lead people, to hire people, to fire people. Um, and it's, I think, something that people often make the mistake of starting a business without actually understanding the business, you know, and, and especially I think back in the days when people took, were, took on apprenticeships um, and actually really learned from masters. And I, you know, for as much as I did not like the last couple of years at K-Force, you know, in hindsight, I am, I am forever grateful for the, for, the, for the experience that I had there and the people that I met I wouldn't have, without K-Force, I would have never met Ingram and never met Marilyn and, and some of the others, actually all of the other people who started with us, we all met at some time at K-Force. And so without that, without that experience, you know, sometimes in, in, in the moment we're, we're, we're angry and bitter about how bad things are in the moment. But, you know, now 14 years later, I am, I am extremely grateful for having not only learned all the things that we learned there, but, but even more so having met the people that we did meet there. So... With that, I'll, I'll pass uh -huh. it up to Ingram. Yeah, yeah. You, you learn, yeah, you learn, I mean, uh, again, you know, I um, had my own small business with, with another partner in the UK before I came out here. Before that, I was in accounting. Um, but without question, the most uh, influential years of my pre-proven professional career in terms of what I learned and the experience that I gained was in that 11 years at K-Force. Um, even down to, um, and, and you know, when I, I had my own small recruiting business um, in the UK, having been at another very small recruiting business uh, in the UK. So I really didn't uh, understand, um, you know, the bigger picture um, in, in terms of what goes into uh, making a successful recruiting company, building a successful recruiting team. Um, I got that at K-Force right from day one. 
uh, the first week at the training, at the, at the real training course, it was the first real training that I had, as opposed to, you know, just being thrown in at the deep end, just saying, listen to what this guy does next to you and just replicate what he does. You know, that's hardly the best, um, you know, guidance in the world. Um, but the uh, level of professionalism, um, I'll tell you what I also learned uh, at, at K-Force was to, to be able to uh, be extremely successful, extremely productive, and yet still manage to maintain uh, a certain ethical system and a certain moral compass that ultimately um, you know, would guide everything that we would do professionally. So, you know, you learn about yourself, you grow into yourself, you find that there's a degree of alignment between your own moral compass, your own personal value system, um, and the value system of the organization that you want to build. That, of course, is in addition to understanding, you know, a business P&L, understanding, you know, all of the different terms that you hear in recruiting that you're then able to apply, understanding the kind of people that do well in the business and with whom you'd want to partner. Um, so, um, you know, leadership, learning about leadership in so many different uh, aspects, failing, quite frankly, and we're going to come on to that in a second. Okay, uh, you're, you're getting ahead. You're getting, you're getting ahead, Ingram. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'm getting excited. Um, but, you know, uh, you can't stress the value um, of um, leadership, right? And we see... Um, Okay, you want me to comment on this slide, Lewis? You see, go, go uh, ahead. You see one fine example of leadership and one complete and utter um, disaster, right? Without wanting to get too political, right? Um, Lewis, do you want to you want to take it away from that? So um, I was actually even thinking about adding additional people uh, who are more even more controversial than, than the two presidents that we've got on here, but you know, I think. People learn how to run a business and how to be a manager, how to be an administrator, how to run operations, how to do so many different aspects of, of business. But I think one of, the, one of the biggest keys that people don't really learn enough of is to learn how to lead. And, and the reason I put uh, both President Trump as well as uh, President Obama, former presidents, is that the, the, they have one thing that is ex the one thing in common that does not separate them and and that's they have huge followings they have passionate following people that are following them that follow them um, and that will go to the ends of the earth um, to to go behind them and i think you know it's it's one of the keys i think to our success is that um whether we learned that at K-Force or whether we, where, however we learned it, we've learned how to lead in a way um, where people follow. And, and it's something I think that is, um, I, I don't know how we did it. Um, maybe Ingram, you can, you can talk about it, but you know, somehow, some way we got to a place where people like working with us. And it's something that we've been very blessed with. No, I think that that's so true. And you know, in all probability, it's the most important aspect. If you want to build a company beyond just you and a couple of other people, um, if you want to build a company, um, you know, you're going to have to hire people and they're going to have to want to work for you. Um, and in today's environment, you know, those people have choices. They can work for you. They can work for somebody else. They can work for, um, you know, many, many different uh, companies. But ultimately, people do choose to to work for people rather than companies. What is a company if it's not a, a collection of individuals? And the leader is, is obviously pivotal um, in, in that organization. Um, and Lewis is absolutely right. You know, regardless of what we think of one or other of, of, the, of, of the two former presidents, right? You know, they clearly both inspired significant amounts of people to follow them and vote for them. Um, and I think the one thing that I learned um, about leadership um, is to be um, honest and direct and transparent and consistent and to treat people with respect, right? And, you know, we often, um, you know, I, one of the things that we're most proud of in our organization is the fact that 99.9% .9 of people who leave us, leave us as friends and leave us as advocates out in the marketplace. 
um, which is phenomenal because when somebody leaves a company, it can be emotionally quite fraught. It can be very, very difficult. Um, and, you know, one of the most important things that I learned was to, to just be straightforward and honest and yet respectful with people. Deliver bad news if you need to deliver bad news, right? But do it in a respectful way um, where people understand um, and they don't feel humiliated. They feel respected. Um, and the other important factor is that, you know, you don't have to be um, a rah-rah person. You don't have to be directorial in order to be a great leader. Everybody has attributes of great leadership within them. Um, you look at some of the great leaders, you look at, using this as an example, General Patton, right? The World War II leader, right? You know, in the army, you have to be very command and control. You know, there's no argument, you do this. Um, Mahatma Gandhi, right? Was very much a quiet, determined, lead by example leader. Um, and so, you know, history and business is um, you know, proliferated with many different types of leader, but they will all have certain um, attributes um, that are there. They're consistent um, and they're transparent and they're honest. Um, and, you know, they treat people with respect. And that ultimately, I think, is the greatest lesson of leadership uh, that anybody can learn. All right, let's see if this works. Okay. So um, I'll just go to the slide, the picture. Ah. So believe it or not, this is actually my garage. And you can actually see my punching bag in the back, my pull-up bar, and I think at the time you can see a little red, blue tricycle thing for my kids. This was... Um, one of our first meetings in my garage on, a, on two plastic Costco tables um, when we started proven recruiting. And, you know, this was, I think this is possibly by far the one thing that separates myself and Ingram from almost everybody else um, who does not start a business. And it's that we took a calculated risk, um, and and I I'm, and I was very deliberate about that term calculated. Um, it wasn't we just said screw it, we're just going to do this without thinking about it. Um, again, we had spent eleven years at K Force, we had learned how to run different aspects of of the recruiting business. Um, we got to know a number of people, and we decided to start a business with um, seven of us all together. Uh, and not just the two of us. I mean, it wasn't just something that we, I was gonna say something we did on a whim. It's almost kind of something that we did on a whim, but we did it very quickly. Um, but it was something that I think this is what's ultimately separates people who, who, who start a business and run a business from those that don't. Because there are a lot of you out there with some great ideas, with some great experience, but ultimately for whatever reason, whether it's familial, financial, circumstantial, whatever the case might be, you, you don't take that chance, you don't take the risk and ultimately start the business and quit your jobs and whatever else might be going on. Um, and so, you know, I, I think this is kind of stereotypical, like we started in a garage and we, we actually did. Um, we didn't actually work in the garage a lot, but we actually met in the garage and, and planned the business from um, the first day um, in my garage. So, Ingram. Bill Gates, Lewis, he started in a garage, didn't he? Um, and yet, um, you know, we're, we're not quite at Bill Gates' uh, uh, level yet, but, you know, all great things start small, right? I think that's, that's the point. I, you know, didn't Amazon start in a, in a, you know, back of a car somewhere? I mean, um, you know, so you, you never know. Um, and yeah, you, you've got to take risks. and, and in our case, that involved considerable financial risk as well. You know, we were both earning, you know, decent money um, at K-Force. Um, and yet we basically gave that up, um, you know, not just to take no salary for two years, but to, you know, raid all of our, you know, little money boxes and banks and 401ks. I mean, every penny we basically had 
um, was put into starting this business, paying the people that you see around this table, uh, each of whom you know, basically placed their trust in us um, that they were gonna come with us and give up their own you know, relatively secure, stable um, careers and financial situations. So you know, we both had mortgages, we both had young kids in school, um, so it was really a case of if it didn't work, um, you know, I'm not quite sure, um, you know, what we would have had to fall back on. I'd have come and, well, we'd have always had your garage that we could have, you know, turned into a communal bedroom or something. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it's a risk and, and you're right, Lewis, I think that that's probably what separates out, um, you know, the majority of people who are very successful at what they do within organizations, but who, for whatever reason, don't have the desire, um, don't want to put, um, you know, their um, financial situations at risk. So, um, but that's what's required. Um, you know, there's going to have to be an element of some risk, um, you know, to a degree, obviously, if it's calculated, the more calculated it is, the, the better. But there's no such thing as a 100% sure bet, right? If you do something, and if you risk your career and your livelihoods, by setting up your own business, you have to understand that it is a risk. Uh, and I don't know what the stats are, Lewis, but we often uh, refer to them. You know, a lot of small businesses do not survive beyond the first year. I think it's, um, I think it's 90% don't survive the first five years. So you got 10%, and then I think of the 10%, the remaining 10%, of the remaining 10%, 90% of those fail within the next five years. So it's like 99 out of 100 fail within the first 10 years of, of starting. And so um, we're, we're at year 14, so we've luckily survived um, those chances. But, you know, one thing I, I think I, I wanna emphasize real fast, that I'm kind of, I don't know, in this accent you may not have understood. Um, you know, we did not pay ourselves for nearly two years. And I think it's, it's one of the things that, when, when people really think about starting a business and sacrificing, you know, that means not eating out ever, you know, for, for, for those that are raised in our society today, I think there's so much of eating out every single day, you know, for lunch or whatever the case might be. Um, but, you know, we, we did not, we didn't take a, a, a salary, not a penny for almost two years. And, you know, it was a calculated risk from the standpoint of if we were going to survive, we poured almost everything that we had into the company um, people have asked me, so what do you guys, what do you do for, who, who's your financial planner? I was like, I'm the financial planner. I don't have one. Where's your money? Well, it's, it's all in the company. <laughs> you, you don't have any savings? Nope. You know, and that, I, that's, that's um, different today, but back in those days, it was just, everything was in the company. And, and I think, um, you know, this idea of being able to do, ha have your cake and eat it too, to be able to have a job and start your company, you know, if that's the case, you're going to be sacrificing your health, your relationships, uh, other things. It may not be money because you're going to try to make money while you're building a company and plenty of people do that as well. Um, but for us, Ingram and I, you know, frankly went all in. And as a result, we had to sacrifice a lot to, to be able to do the things that we did. And I think that that's why it's important if you, not that I'm expecting you to go back to the first slide, but our life partners, right? Our significant others, um, you know, they had to be all in as well. Um, you know, at our company holiday event um, at the end of each year, beginning of each year, the very first thing that we do is that we recognize our partners, right? Because, and, and certainly in, in Lewis's and my case with, with Leanne and Jane, um, you know, uh, had they not been as supportive um, and as understanding as they were about the sacrifices that not just we needed to make, but they were going to have to make too, it clearly would not have been possible. So very, very important. And again, feeds into choosing the right partner. Hmm. Interested to see the picture on this. <laughs> oh, but, we, but we are the best looking and best dressed in the room. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I think this was taken on a leadership offsite. We were, I, I can't exactly remember why we took this picture the way we did it, but uh, this was pre-COVID. Um, Although, although we, we have the masks, the yes, ready made. Yes, yeah, so this is not a COVID picture, um, and, and we are not a power, part of a gang. But you know, I think it's it's one of the things that we've done well is 
like we said earlier, we have hired people to do specific roles. And, and the thing that we did not try to do is that we weren't trying to do everything. And, you know, Michelle is somebody who's on here. Uh, she is a great writer. Um, Shen and Mike are really, really good recruiters, better than I think I could have ever been. Um, and especially now, you know, at this stage of my life and the stage of our careers, definitely better than what we could do. And so I think it's extremely important, you know, they may not be better business people yet, um, but it's something that, that, that you know, we, we quickly realized that we could not be in all places at all times trying to make all decisions for every single little thing that happens at this company. Otherwise, we would be a seven person company or might even be a two person company. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's one of the things that's really important to, to, you know, to give up control and let other people make decisions rather than Ingram and myself constantly deciding for ourselves and deciding for the company. Yeah, um, and you know, to, to add to that, it uh, goes back to another leadership lesson. Um, you know, don't be afraid, don't let your own ego get in the way. I think that both of us um, you know, aren't you know, particularly egotistical, right? And so you know, throughout my career, um, to the extent that I've succeeded in any kind of leadership and management role, um, I, the single most important reason for that is because I've been completely unafraid and in fact sought to hire people who are better than me, okay? Um, because as, as Lewis inferred, you know, we, we can't do everything. We're not particularly good at everything. We're good at some things, not so good at others, right? Um, but throughout, you know, your careers, if you, if you start businesses, um, you're only going to be as good as the people that you hire. Um, and if the people who you hire are better in some areas than you, um, they will make you look good and they will make your business very, very successful. So hire people who are better than you uh, and don't be afraid, um, you know, if, if they are better than you in certain areas. Because but, we, but I, we aren't the smartest people in the room. But I think that the... the you know, the truth is that I think we all know that the certain people that are better at aspects of business or life better than we are. But I think that the biggest challenge is actually giving up the control, ceding control to those individuals. And even though it's not exactly the way that you would have done it yourself, it's something that is to give them, to empower them to make those decisions. I think it's one of the toughest things. And, you know, um, you guys will actually see it later on, but but our logo is currently, um, I don't know if I have it here. I've got it here somewhere. This is, this is currently our logo, okay? And you'll see, that I had a really hard time accepting this as our logo because the original logo is, is the one that I personally came up with. I chose the colors and, um, when we had a director of marketing, she came up with this new logo and I had a really hard time accepting it. And, you know, the thing that I ultimately had to come to terms with was if we have somebody in the role as a director of marketing, that I had to give up control to let her make that decision rather than to, to let me or for me to make that decision. And if I was going to make that decision, then why, why should we pay for a director of marketing? And so, you know, it, it, that was, I think, about five or six years ago when I, when I came to terms with that. And it was something that was really difficult for me, um, even though I see myself as somebody who, who likes to give other people control. But it was something that when I faced with it, it was really hard. So um, anyway, anything else, Ingram? Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, this is, I think, a slide that I actually use for another rec presentation. So um, I'll speak to this myself. Um, I applied to med school, or I, I took the MCATs and I did horribly, and I applied to med school, and I did not get into a single school after applying to five schools. I thought my life was over. Um, at K Force, even though I managed one of the largest offices in the country, I was basically on the verge of getting fired and, and rated as one of the worst managers. I think the word was maverick uh, was, was one of the descriptions. Um, I think there were other descriptions that were used behind closed doors that, that I didn't hear, but um, I was definitely rated as one of the worst managers in the country. Um, the, the picture of jujitsu down there, um, I'm a black belt jujitsu now. I've done 14 years of jujitsu, but 
in my first six years I did jujitsu, I went to competitions. I didn't win a single competition, not even one match for, for nearly six years. Um, and, and I think it was by year eight when I actually ended up winning the national championship uh, as a purple belt in jujitsu. But, you know, if I had given up because of failure, um, I wouldn't be a black belt today. Um, and then at Proven, you'll see the logo down there. Um, that was our original logo or something close to it. Um, and, and you'll see the, the cemetery of locations that we have down there, London, Washington, DC, Madison, Wisconsin, Phoenix, Carlsbad, and Silicon Valley. And we're missing a couple as well, aren't we? I think we had nine at one point. Oh no, that's right, because we've got LA, Dallas. San, San Diego, okay. okay. So the, each of those locations cost about a half a million dollars to start, to fund, to pay the people that we um, that we that we put into those offices. So if you if you look at that, you know, half a million dollars on average times six, that's three million dollars that we invested slash wasted and lost out on. And, and, and so uh, I'm not going to get into the to the condom story because that's a totally different fail story. Um, I'll, I'll leave it for 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 another presentation. <laughs> Shams over here is upset, but. I'll leave it for another day. But, you know, I think through all of those times, I remember thinking in some form or fashion, I am a failure. I've, my life is over when I couldn't get into med school. I'm a complete failure. How can I, how can I face my parents? Uh, I'm a complete failure for six years. I could not win a single jujitsu match. I thought, what am I doing? I just might as well quit. This is just completely stupid. Um, at K Force, the last two years, especially the last six months, just being so miserable in my job and, and, and thinking about how unfair it was that I was being forced out at a company that I wanted to retire at for the rest of my life. And then, even in starting our own business at K or at Proven here, um, starting offices, and especially the one in Washington, D.C., which I was so proud of, and for Ingram London. Um, you know, I grew up in Washington, D.C. And, and, and Ingram, obviously, in London. And to, to have to close down those offices and basically come back to San Diego and back to the West Coast with our tails between our legs, I, I remember being essentially embarrassed about that. Um, but, you know, if you're not failing, you're effectively not trying. And I think, you know, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that failure is such a huge part of succeeding you don't get to where we are or where anybody is who is successful without major failures in your life. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll let Ingram take it. Yeah, I, I think this is probably the most important um, slide in, in, in the deck, right? Um, certainly up there. Um, you know, I, I had a, well, first of all, I want to say that, you know, Lewis is doing himself a little bit of an injustice, right, when he's um, referencing some of the, uh, the, the failures. He, he, he wasn't a failure at K-Force, um, and he certainly hasn't failed um, at Jiu-Jitsu, maybe at the beginning, but that's neither here nor there. I think the, the important message here is um, you're going to fail, okay? I, I had a slightly different take. I... Um, have never been particularly embarrassed by failure. Um, I've, I've seen it, uh, and I'll come on to perhaps why, there, there's that slight difference in a second. I've seen it just as you know, one of the consequences of, of trying something um, and risking something, uh, and that means that at some point you're going to fail. Um, I think it was either Richard Branson or Jeff Bezos, both of whom are obviously in the news um, for different reasons right now, um, who said, you know, of the 300 business ventures that I started that have, you know, maybe 90% of them have failed, okay? Um, my, own, um, uh, my own connection with failure probably comes from my father, who was an entrepreneur, um, who built, you know, an empire of um, restaurants and businesses. He actually had the uh, the first gay club in London in the 1970s. Um, so he was a, a pioneer, right? He was an entre a serial entrepreneur, right? But the word calculated when it comes to risk uh, didn't enter into his vocabulary. Um, you know, he just, you know, somebody came at him with an idea, right? He, um, 
uh, he just went for it. So I think failure is, is something that um, you don't need to be afraid of. Um, you know, almost to go as far as celebrate failure, right? If you're going to use it as an experience in life and learn from that experience in life, it's no bad thing. Abraham Lincoln was the, the, the most failed politician on the face of the planet. Failed in business, failed in his senatorial bids on multiple occasions, right? And there's this famous uh, slide that's out there. Failed, 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 failed. And yet at the age of 52 was elected, you know, the most consequential president in, in the history of the United States. So um, don't be afraid of failure. Um, you know, certainly culturally in some cultures, right, failure is, is deemed to be um, a lot worse than in others, right? But if you're going to be in business, if you aspire to owning your own business, um, then don't be afraid to fail. Learn from it by all means, but it's all part of the journey. I couldn't, I, think, I couldn't agree more. I think I think Ingram is much more mature than I am. I got a fragile ego. I don't want to fail. <laughs> I don't like trying new jujitsu moves. I don't like trying new things in some of those ways because I don't feel I don't want to feel, and especially when people are watching, just like, you know. And I, I will tell a story real fast when it comes to jujitsu. I think it, it was the one. I think I might have shared. I, I actually did share it last time, um, but you know, it was year six when I kept going to these matches and I kept losing in my first match and my boys were I think five years old at the time and they said to me daddy 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 he's got a medal he's got a medal where's your medal daddy where's your medal and I remember thinking I was like shut up be quiet I'm like trying to hurry out of the gym scurry out daddy look he's got a medal too where's your medal I'm like oh my god and and I remember in that moment thinking to myself I need to get serious about this I need to make sure that I never feel like this ever again. And so, you know, the, the lesson in that moment really was I didn't take what I was doing seriously enough. And whether it's jujitsu or whether it's school, whether it's our business, um, you know, we can all know whether we're really making the effort and really giving it everything we've got, or we're just going through the motions of showing up to the classes and kind of doing the moves and kind of trying but are we really putting everything we've got into it? And, and from that moment, I vowed, number one, never to take my kids to another match ever again, which they'd never been to. Uh, but two, to never embarrass myself and especially my school, my professor and my family and myself. And, um, you know, it was, I think the next year or the year after that, I ended up winning the national championship. But um, it, it did come as a result of failure and, and it did become because I was embarrassed as much as anything. Um, so my ego's a little bit more fragile than Ingram's. All right, next slide. Um, let's see here. All right. So I think we've talked about this a little bit. This is actually from our, this year's, this most recent year's holiday party. Um, yeah. And can I, can I just interject uh, just really quickly? So uh, for, for the rec students who are coming in, uh, just uh, we're, we are just uh, finishing up uh, with our workshop here. And um, we'll get started on our uh, the rest of the lecture in a little bit. But um, yeah, just hang tight and uh, and hang out with us. So we do have some people coming in and out with, in the classes. So, all right, take it away. <laughs> okay. Um, so you know we we talked about this a little bit, but I think one of the most important things that we've done again is is word leverage, leveraging our people, uh, leveraging our experience, leveraging um, our relationships, and you know it, it's something that we've learned to do extremely well. Um, and, and it's about all the different things that different people bring to the table. Um, and and I, I know that we've got a, a lot less time now, but um, Ingram, you wanna hit on this at all? No, don't, don't worry about the time, it's okay. I mean, we have okay. our, our cl class, I mean, we can just take our all class right, time for this. If people need to leave, they'll leave if they, if they um, uh, yeah. Wanna all right, they can sounds good, Tanya. Yeah, um, but again, the one thing that I will um, pick up on, yes, I mean, and this is, clearly linked to, um, you know, hiring the right people. Mm. We're not the smartest people in the room. Um, you know, leverage all of your resources, leverage your most important asset, which in any business is people, the different strengths that, that each of those people uh, bring to the organization. But also most importantly, right, especially as we move into the kind of social entrepreneurship that we're going to be talking about in a second, right? And as, as Tanya has said, you know, being a good company that changes the world, um, you've got to bring people, you've got to leverage the different backgrounds and ethnicities and education 
um, that, that, that people actually have. Um, you know, we have a phrase that we're fond of saying, you know, we don't look for culture fits. We look for culture ads. How can you enhance our culture? How can you make our culture better? There's no such thing as a, as a company that has a fixed culture and it never changes, you know? Um, so, you know, whether you have, you know, a different uh, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, um, whether you come from a different country, whether you, you, you know, come from a different educational background, um, you know, culture ad is something that we um, uh, use as a significant part of building the leverage um, that ultimately is going to be the platform upon which um, any company can grow. And the next slide will be, I could paint a picture for them. Ah, uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So, um, okay. Um, there's a couple different layers of, of this, this slide here. Um, this is one of our former employees, um, Jerry McMillan. But if you can see the award there, it says the Jason Collins Memorial Founders Award. Jason was one of our original seven. Um, he originally, uh, unfortunately passed away due to a opiate um, overdose. Um, and, you know, we would not be here if we had not, if it had not been for, for Jason and for people like Jason stepping up and becoming part of the original seven to put the company together. And so, um, you know, in, in the last couple of years of Jason's life, um, he moved back to Wisconsin. And, and one of the things that he did so generously was to give up his time. Um, he was part of what was called the Underdog Railroad. And, and what this network of, of people did was that they took dogs from high sh kill states to no kill states. And they would drive these dogs from one hour at a time from, from one person to the next and take them from places like Louisiana and Alabama to places like uh, Minnesota. And so if you can imagine, that's a long drive. And, and Jason, every Sunday during football season, and he loved the bears, he would, he would give up his time so that he could drive these dogs one hour at a time. I, I, don't, I, I had a picture of him, but, but I don't have the picture right there. But on the t-shirt, um, that's a picture of Jason when he was on one of the mountains here in San Diego. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it's extremely important as you think about what it is that, that we're doing. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about is that Proven is, it's, it's a recruiting firm. There are plenty of recruiting firms. There's, there's three recruiting firms in, in our building alone. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about is that Proven is a platform. It is a vehicle for us to accomplish the things that we want to accomplish in our lives. It is not the thing that we do in our lives. It is, it is the way that we accomplish the things that we want in our lives. And I think there, many times people get confused about what it is that they're actually doing. Are they just working or are they trying to do other things in their lives? And, and you know, whether it's helping animals or helping your parents or getting rid of, you know, becoming financially independent or whatever the case might be, um, you know, Proven is a vehicle and a platform for us, for Ingram and I to achieve our goals in our lives, as well as the, our employees to achieve the things that they want in their lives. Um, and so the next person on here um, is Marilyn Kafori. Why don't, you, why don't you speak to Marilyn Ingram? Yeah, no, I mean, Marilyn is, um, you know, Marilyn is one of the people that you saw around the uh, garage table, right? And Marilyn has been with us, you know, well, not just for the last 14 years, but for what, at least eight or nine of the years before that. One of the most remarkable women you will ever ever meet. Um, she has endured significant uh, personal challenges um, in her life, um, including, and this is public, um, you know, if, if for people that might or might not remember the Santana High School shooting um, about 15, 16 years ago, um, Marilyn's son um, was uh, only, uh, only survived that because the shooter pointed a gun at him um, and it didn't go off. Right, so that's just one example of some of the tribulations that Marilyn has, has had to deal with um, within her family. Uh, and yet she, uh, and I think she's lost, is it one or two members of her family, Lewis? To, her, her mother and her brother to MS. Right, right, uh, had MS. And so Marilyn um, inspires uh, all of us with her commitment to, um, you know, multiple sclerosis, 
charity is the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. Um, and we as a company um, are you know, thrilled to be able to support Marilyn um, and we match in a number of different ways um, in the efforts that she has in order to promote the work of the foundation, which I think you know, that the highlight of it is, uh, and Marilyn is a you know, 54, 55 year old woman um, who you wouldn't necessarily think that way if you met her, um, but she walks whatever it is, 35 miles um, uh, in order actually, to- Actually, it's, it's actually over a hundred miles in three days. So- <laughs> five miles a day. Right. So that's pretty significant for anybody, right? Um, so that's, again, just um, uh, indicative of, of, of the kind of people that we hire. Uh, and, and again, it goes to the kind of people that we actually hire as well. You know, we look for people that, that can do the job, obviously, um, but they have to align with, one, with, with our uh, core values and guiding principles, one of the most important and significant of which is giving back. Um, and that's not that we require people to do certain things, right? It's, it's, in, it's deeply embedded and entrenched in uh, our talent acquisition process. You know, we look for certain kinds of people that are aligned um, and giving back is a, is a key part of, uh, of everything that we do. Um, and that's, you know, Marilyn embodies that uh, in ways that- uh, By the way, she is, a, she is a grandmother as well. So, <laughs> you know, she does all of this. Um, in addition to helping raise grandkids too. Um, and then, you know, just, just one last thing here. I just included this because I like the big check. Um, and, and it's one of the, you know, we were able to help just in time, with, which helps kids who are um, in the foster care system transition from the foster care system to adulthood. And, you know, for, for as tough as my life was uh, growing up, for as little money as we had, um, and for as bitter as I was, in my teens, um, you know, realizing that at least I had parents, at least I had guides there for me, even though after I graduated from high school and after I graduated, it became 18, I had always had somewhere to go. Um, and, you know, to think about kids who, once they turn 18 in the foster care system, they have nowhere to go. Um, it was one of the reasons why we, we worked with Just In Time. So, um, you know, these are all things that we're able to do as a result of doing our business, as a result of, of go ahead, Ingram. Yeah, no, and, and if I can add to that, um, you know, it's one of the things that bind us together very, very strongly. Um, you know, sure, we want to make money. Sure, you know, we invested, you know, two years of our lives in which we didn't take any money and, you know, almost ran out of money. Um, so, of course, we want to make money. Of course, we want, you know, to provide for our families and our children and we want to go out and, and go on decent vacations. But, right, unlike with a lot of, um, uh, you know, companies, right, um, you know, that's, that's not the be all and end all for us. Yes, we want that. But, you know, as you can see, you know, with, with some of the individuals, right, that we've highlighted on this slide, but also, you know, being um, a relatively significant part of the San Diego business community, for example, right, gives us a level of relevance and a degree of significance that allows us to use our position and our relative success as a platform to promote some of the initiatives that are important to us, um, you know, both socially and obviously in the workplace. Right, DEI is is obviously one of those. You know, had it just been us 14 years ago, right, with no platform, just waving a flag, saying, "Hey, you know what? We believe in, for example, DEI." Right, nobody would have listened to us. Right now, they listen. Right, because we're relevant in 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 the lives of the communities. So, you know, that's the purpose for us. You know, whether it's that, whether it's um, using our platform for um, for for other causes, um, that's the purpose beyond profit. But without the profit, right, we wouldn't necessarily be in a position that would allow us to have the voice that we have right now. Um, and, you know, going back to my background, um, you know, Lewis mentioned the, 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 the value system that we have that uh, I think has, has been primarily inspired by my Jewish upbringing. You know, we have a phrase and a saying, tikkun olam, right, which is fundamental to, to, to Jewish thinking and, and Jewish acts. And that's to repair the world, right? And so, you know, if we can do that, by leveraging our platform, what we've created over the course of the last 14 years, um, to, to just repair it in little ways, which is really what Purpose Beyond Profit is all about, then you know, we'll have contributed in ways that I think both of us um, are comfortable with. Can you, Ingram, say that saying again? 
Yeah, Tikkun Olam, right? The transliteration is T-I-K-K-U-N, new word Olam. I'll type it in the chat box. Tikkun Olam, it means to repair the world. Love it. You know, I, there is one thing I, I do want to emphasize here, which is that we are not just, and we're not, frankly, saints. Okay, we have our issues. Um, and, and, you know, at the same time, I think some people do at times forget that we are a for-profit business. And without the profits, we can't help people or we can't help them as much. And, and it's something that I think, you know, that it's a hard thing to, to, to prioritize and balance at times because sometimes we're criticized for not being generous enough. Um, I think one year we actually gave something, it was like two, over $200,000 to charities um, as a small company. It was, it was kind of ridiculous. <laughs> Um, and this was like 10 years ago when we were nowhere near as big as we are today. Um, but, you know, I think it, it, it's something within the for-profit sector and even in the nonprofit sector, you have to make money. If you do not make money, you do not exist. And if you don't exist, you can't help as many people. Yes. And, and, and I think it's something that um, is, is sometimes over, overlooked. Um, and again, I don't want to emphasize that, you know, look, I love helping people. But we, we also have a business to run, and it's, it's always a, a balance and, and trying to keep that balance and make sure that we're not, frankly, too greedy. And we don't forget that we also run a full profit business. So, all right, next slide. Um, I forgot what's, what's here. Oh, I think we're, we're actually getting toward the end here. I'm glad Shen is here um, because, um, you know, we could have done a regular award, but um, we, we actually, we named our award the the made should happen award. Um, and I remember one of our employees who actually got stopped at the airport because they had this in their suitcase and um, they were stopped and asked, what the heck is this? They said, well, um, it's my employee of the year award or employee of the month award. And they actually took it out and looked at it. And they, the uh, TSA actually appreciated it for, for what it was because it was, it was different and, and named something interesting. Um, um, you know, some of the other things that we do that I think many companies don't do is we, we run a book club and we are, um, I think we're, I don't know how many books in, but we're currently reading, um, doesn't hurt to ask by um, Trey something or another. Uh, he's a former, former congressman um, and, and prosecutor from South Carolina. Um, that's Helen, one of our former employees. I can't remember why this picture was taken, but she was obviously having a good laugh. Um, that's Puya from our from our LA office. Um, if you take a look at his neck, for some reason he got shot in the neck three or four times uh, with with paintballs, and this was after this was during a, a, a paintball session up in LA. Um, and then this was a, a, a women in tech happy hour that we hosted on our patio uh, here in the office in, in San Diego. And then um, this was a most recent trip that we did to uh, Hawaii for our, our top uh, recruiters. And so, you know, I think the reason I put all of this up here was, you know, all this stuff is a result of things that we have come up with um, and trying to be different and trying to be not do the normal stuff you know by itself individually i think many companies do one of these things but for a small company like ours uh, we pride ourselves in being i think ingram ingram has said it before in being a little off center okay and you know whether it's your goal to be different or to be special or to be not be normal and not be average um i think too many times people think that they're special and not normal, but they don't do the stuff that actually makes them special and not normal. And so, um, Ingram? Yeah, and I think the, um, the celebration, again, that's another of our core values and guiding principles, it celebrates success. What's important here is that we don't, um, you know, unlike a lot of other quotes unquote sales companies, we don't just, just celebrate those who have achieved the highest levels of performance. Of course, we celebrate them, right? But at least two of the awards, the Make Shit Happen Award, um, is given to, um, you know, the employee of the month 
um, who, and, and it could be for whatever reason, it could be that somebody went and um, cycled 100 miles for charity, right? And that, that's no. So every month that gets awarded and it can be, you, everybody votes, right? And they can vote for whatever reason they want. And, and generally speaking, um, it's, it's not about um, production. And the person that has most votes over the course of the year, which generally tends to be a support person that's not in a production role, um, you know, will we'll join us on the uh, incentive trip to Hawaii or Mexico or wherever it is. So, you know, there's that award. And then there's also the, the Founders Award, which I think, Lewis, um, uh, we, we saw Jerry with, with, with earlier on. And that is given in, in, in the late Jason Collins's memory um, to the person who most embodies the values that, that Jason um, embodied himself, you know, kindness, giving back. Um, uh, and so on. So these are non-production um, values, right, that we recognize and, and celebrate in addition to the production. But, but we want people to, um, you know, to do special stuff, whether it's in the production arena or whether it's in the non-production arena. And we recognize that. And, that, and that's actually Nick from our Dallas office who, is, uh, who won the Jason Collins Founders Award. And, and that's why he and his wife are standing over Hananamu Bay in, in Hawaii. So... Um, anyway, that was, that was a special moment for those guys. Um, Tanya, did you want to add something or say something? No, I was just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed by all that you do. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that everybody in here who's, uh, who's not starting their own startup is probably thinking, I want to come work for your company. Um, <laughs> just amazing. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of hard work behind the scenes that has to happen as well, but we do have fun too. Um, so I think this might be the last slide. Um, <laughs> Ingram didn't, didn't really love this slide, but you know, I think it's, it's indicative of life and, and the fact that we all get injured. We all have those moments and we all have um, times when we just don't feel like things are fair or things are going our way. Um, but, you know, I, there's a saying in jujitsu, you don't, it never gets easier, you only get stronger. And I, the reason I put the, the, the ellipses there, the dots there, is the fact that if you continue to try harder, if you deliberately practice, it just doesn't happen by accident, it just doesn't all of a sudden you just get stronger. But you know, the, the idea of, for example, that a mile gets shorter, it's not the case. A mile doesn't get easier, you get stronger. A 50 pound weight never gets less, doesn't become less. You get stronger and that weight becomes easier to do because you're getting stronger. And I think, you know, I, the, the, the sad news, the bad news for those of you guys that are not parents um, is that life is only going to get harder. <laughs> it's about as easy as it's going to be for you. And if you're going to actually become a manager and or become a business owner, it only gets that much more complicated and that much harder. Um, but the good news is that with deliberate practice, I mean, and, and again, you are going to fail. You are going, it's going to be hard. You're going to hurt yourself. And, and frankly, you might hurt, even hurt some people along the way. Um, but, you know, if you can keep getting back up and keep trying and, and, you know, the idea of deliberate practice, which we won't get into today, but the idea of not just going to the golf range, just swinging the clubs and just kind of hacking at the ball, but actually really learning and trying and understanding what you're doing and, and, and really applying new skills and trying to learn new skills is, is the reason why we've been able to do what we've done. We don't, we don't operate this business the same way that we operated it 14 years ago. And I hope in 14 years, if we're still around, that we're absolutely not operating at the way that we're operating it today. And, and so, you know, I think, you know, this picture of Ingram, well, he hates it. He's like, why are you taking this picture of me? You can even see it. <laughs> but um, in the New York snowstorm of uh, three or four years ago, right? And I slipped and, and that's in a New York hotel room. Um, but yes, uh, but you know, to, to, to Lewis's point, um, you're gonna fail. Um, it's important to just learn and practice and apply. One of my favorite phrases actually is, um, you know, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. 
Um, you know, if you consistently practice your golf swing and it's wrong, you're not going to get perfect. It's ju you're just going to make it more permanent, right? So applying and tweaking and learning from life's experiences um, are all very, very important. That's how you get stronger. And that's how it becomes a lot more fun. Um, but, you know, my guidance would always be continue to follow your passion um, and never lose the sense of aspiration and optimism that you have to have um, if you're thinking about starting a business. You have to be the consummate optimist. Right? And I know Lewis wouldn't necessarily describe himself as, you know, um, an unfettered optimist, right? more a realist, right? But you've got to be hopeful. You've got to be aspirational. Um, if you're starting something that, you know, people think these guys are crazy. Remember that, Lewis? I mean, there were plenty of people who thought 14 years ago, what are these guys doing, right? And those were uh, our friends. <laughs> and they were our friends, you're right. Um, so you've got to be aspirational. Um, and um, that's, that's the only thing that I would say, right? Continue to, to keep, you know, to do the right thing, um, to have that, you know, wanting to repair the world and, and, and do good use a platform that your companies that you will no doubt create and be very successful, right? Um, always bear in mind, um, you know, good companies that change the world. I've written that down, Tanya, good companies that change the world um, and never lose that sense of faith and optimism in, in what you're doing. Love it. I love it. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I know we're uh, getting near the end of the slides. And is there anything else uh, that you'd like to add, Lewis, to take us out with? I, I feel like it's, uh, you've shared so much and just there's so many pearls of wisdom in here. I'm just uh, loving it. I can't wait to watch the recording again. But uh, anything else you'd like to leave us with, Lewis? Or Ingram? Um, you know what? I think the one thing that I didn't share in here was um, just to have a sense of gratitude. And, um, you know, regardless of how bad the day is, you know, when you can get back home, and especially if you, if you have a home and you have a family to, to be thankful for the things that have transpired that day, um, you know, because not everybody has those things. And the next day the sun rises again and we got another chance to do it all over again. And so, um, you know, again, my perspective 14 years later, having left K-Force, is I am grateful for all of those, all that time. Even the last two years, I was extremely miserable. I hated, I hated my company. I hated my job. I hated my team. I hated myself. I hated my life. And you know, if if it weren't for that misery, I would have never left. And Ingram would have started his company on his own, and it wouldn't have been called Proven. Um, you know, and I would still be there. I'd probably be miserable. Um, and, and so sometimes the misery is what forces you to get into that new phase of your life. And, um, you know, but, but it just doesn't happen by happenstance. You, you have to work toward those things. And, you know, just to emphasize the last point there, um, it is through that deliberate practice and constantly tweaking and learning and, and trying again and trying again and tweaking um, and not making it permanent, but, but really learning from those mistakes and those those opportunities. So gratitude and, and constantly, you know, learning from those mistakes. I love it. What a wonderful workshop. Yeah, Ingram, yeah. No, I, I just want to say, you know, thank you to everybody. You know, Tanya, um, um, Stephen, I think it was Angela, uh, and everybody else that was involved. Um, and just remember one thing, right? It's, it's you that inspire us. Okay, you know, I see that video at the beginning of your presentation. It's you that inspire us, right? That's certainly what inspires me, right? I don't think there's anything more uh, rewarding, right, than to see, you know, the next generation of leaders uh, come through, um, because that's what gives us, you know, uh, older people uh, a little bit of hope, right, that, you know what, maybe it's not all doom and gloom, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if the world is in, 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 in the hands of people like you, then there's hope for all of us. So keep going. Same way. I feel, thank you. Ah, that was wonderful, wonderful, so inspirational. I love it. Thank you so much. Thanks for everything um, that you do. Thank you, everybody who is here today. Hi, everyone. My name is Tanya Hertz, and I'm the director of the Regional Entrepreneurship Center, the Rec Innovation Lab at San Diego Miramar College. And I'd like to thank our partners at this time and give a special thanks to SDSU's Lavin Center, the SDSU Zip Launchpad, 
We'd like to thank the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. Also like to thank Harness, the Brink SBDC at USD, San Diego Unified Schools. We'd also like to thank School of Entrepreneurship and Technology, High Tech High, the Regional Advisory Committee, Alex Waters at the Jacobs Center, Connect All, 21 IQ Labs, Startup Quest, Productified. I'd like to thank Course Key and Tech Coast Angels. Thank you to Village Up, City Heights Development Corporation, San Diego Angel Conference, Startup San Diego, SBDC, Score San Diego, We Are Kingdom, New Media Rights, San Diego Tech Hub, Origin 63, Ambrosio 15, OmniSync, Optima Office, Proven Recruiting, Craft Leadership, GSNL Consulting. Thank you to all of our partners. We couldn't do what we do without you. Thank you.